What makes a house a home? We asked the people of Scotland and nine regional winners from across the country have made it through to the grand final. In Glasgow's magnificent House for an Art Lover by renowned architect Charles Rennie McIntosh, the judges must now choose which of the finalists will win the title. Interior designer Anna Campbell-Jones. I'm a little bit nervous, um, filled with anticipation. It's going to be really tough to whittle it down even to three, let alone to find one that we can crown Scotland's Home of the Year. Architect and university lecturer Michael Angus. I don't think I've ever seen quite such a rich variety and breadth of types of homes, scale, size, character, taste. They're all so varied. Lifestyle blogger Kate Spears. We've definitely got some tough decisions to make because we've got such an incredible variety of homes this year from tiny little cottages to passive houses. So it's a great mix and I'm excited to see how we'll whittle it down. In the end, only one can be Scotland's Home of the Year. The finalists start to arrive and meet their competition for the first time. Massive surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's really been inside or seen it. I mean, our architect who designed the house hasn't seen it. We made it for us, and I don't know what anyone else thinks about it because we've hardly had anyone round. We've done everything on a budget, and everything's been handmade or upcycled or painted in some way, but it's not just off the shelf. It makes it even more special that other people have seen it and loved it, so yeah, we're thrilled. I'm a little nervous, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Myself and my husband are really proud. I'm, I mean, we put in a lot of sweat equity, I suppose, a lot of hard work and a lot of love went into making it. So, yeah, we think we, we feel really proud of what we achieved. I love our home. I wouldn't change anything. Ultimately, it's a family home, which is fun and we've injected a lot of life into it. It's just a really nice place to come home to every day. We wanted to create a light and kind of airy space with, with what was there. It was a bit sort of run down and dilapidated before we moved in, so we've done a lot of work to kind of renovate and breathe a bit of life back into the house. The best outcome would obviously be to like win, but just like to be able to participate and to even like get to the finals yeah, is amazing. So we're just like super proud of whatever Absolutely. happened. My home is just everything about me, I suppose. It's, it's the thing that contains me, holds me. It contains a lot of my own work. For my home to be in this competition was a bit strange because I didn't really understand why. Um, and I've constantly been thinking, you know, where, what about all the other people? They must have wonderful homes and what am I doing here? So today's going to be interesting actually seeing what other people's houses are like. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we probably didn't expect to be here. It's just a wee one-bedroom cottage, so we've really tried to make it a cosy wee place to live in, a nice wee home. Definitely looking forward to seeing other people's houses today. We get all our inspiration from online and seeing other people's stuff, so it'll be really, really cool to see what else is here. I'll go home with a list of things to change. <laughs> <laughs> I love the location of the home. It's on my family farm, so it's great to be able to live where I grew up. Our home's so unique, um, there's not another one like it. All the work Ewan's put into it, and myself for designing it, we just feel so lucky. We've had several homes in, in different ages. We've had a new home, we've had homes that we've refurbished, but this mm -hmm. is our last yeah. home, our home for life. Yeah, it really is, it's a super yeah. place to live. Every time I see it, I smile, uh -huh. yeah. Oh, it's really exciting. When you see all the other houses and things, it's just amazing. They're all so unique. When we got the call to say we were in the final, it was just a fantastic moment. I think our jaws just hit the floor. For the day that we entered the competition, we've always been surprised by getting further yeah, on. Yeah, so. I didn't think it would go any further. I would just thought, oh, just do it. Just in the spur of the moment. Because I hadn't even told John I was doing it. And that was a surprise. <laughs> and that was a surprise. Believe us. <laughs> it's been great meeting all the other people, just having a day out in Glasgow, you know, that's fun. I love having a nose around other people's houses, so this is ideal for me, really. <laughs> just lovely to see everybody's homes and how much love and energy they've poured into their homes um, and that everyone's really passionate about their homes so yeah it's been and, lovely. And let's be honest we can't wait to meet the judges. <laughs> yeah. Well hello and welcome. It's just awesome to be able to put faces to some of the amazing homes that we've been travelling all across Scotland to see. 
It's been an absolute joy to see so many beautiful homes. Thank you for allowing us in and letting us see your beautiful spaces. We have visited 27 homes from all over Scotland and you are our nine worthy finalists. But we now have to pick our top three, from which one will be crowned Scotland's Home of the Year. Right, so we've got to go off and deliberate. Well, good luck or wish us luck. <laughs> it's going to be tough. The judges retire to the deliberation room where they'll consider each home in turn before deciding on their top three. So, shall we start our deliberations with the cute little lawn cottage, our wonderful finalist from the Highlands? Such a nice little front door, isn't it? I love that mustard sofa. I remember being more windows than I imagined. <laughs> Located in Fort William, this one bedroom cottage is a first home to Kira, Aran, and their border colleague, Ghost. I think our home stands out because it's obviously tiny, but we've really made most of every inch of space that we've got. Equally, it's not too crammed, it's just filled with things that we love and it's a nice, colourful, happy place to be. <laughs> we made our home the way we like to live in it, so it might not stand out for other people, but it's certainly the, the home we want. Feels like a treat going there every night after work. <laughs> just a, a small one-bedroom cottage, you don't really expect to be in Scotland's Home of the Year final. It's really nice, really <laughs> nice feeling to be here for all the hard work that we've put into it. The collection of homes that are on display um, are, are really... The bar is very high. The bar is very high. <laughs> um, so we don't have any expectations, we're just happy to be here today. I was so surprised that they managed to really pack in a punch and they didn't feel like they were restricted with that tiny footprint. It was absolutely incredible the way that they'd not really gone for the sort of minimal feel in there. I just think it'd been done so tastefully and it was just so consistent throughout. So it was definitely one of my favourites. It really made me think about the intimacy of living in a home, you know, because there was no room for thresholds because it was, in a sense, a fairly compressed scale. And I thought that just would obviously have set up quite a, a unique way of living in a home like that. Plus, I really love the big windows and the small wall. <laughs> <laughs> good glass to wall ratio yeah, for good you Yeah, good glass then, to wall, I like that. It was like a good glass to wall ratio. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like apartment living, wasn't it? It, it? Everything had a purpose, no bit of space was wasted, but you had something that was a bit like an urban apartment with garden. Yeah. And I thought the garden was lovely. I love the fact that the garden was bigger than the home itself and definitely was treated as an extension of the home. I think if I lived there, I'd feel the need to push my elbows out the, out the walls and <laughs> stick my head through the roof. <laughs> I'd be a giant in that home, I think. Yes, it would certainly cause a stir, the giant in the tiny house yeah, in the village. i just stand up and the building's attached to me and I walk away. <laughs> But you never once hit your head, Michael, so... No, no, no. you're right, actually. The floor-to-ceiling was very good. Yeah. I think even though the structure itself wasn't overly impressive, what they'd done inside was just, it was really consistent. They'd obviously had this style that was very them. Every single space in the home had been made over in a beautiful way. I wouldn't say it was minimal. It was quite packed in there. They had, like, a lot of beautiful tiles and, and things like that, and they'd quite, sort of mixed patterns and prints. Yeah, very strong, very bold colour palette, and actually in such small spaces to use dark colours. A lot of people think that that's going to make the space feel smaller, but I think that's one of the tricks that they use to make the spaces feel bigger and more connected to each other. The secret to living in a small home is for everything to have its place. It's known as the toothbrush principle. Like, you never lose your toothbrush because you always put it in the same place and they apply that to every single thing that they own and that's why it feels so calm and uncluttered. We love Lawn Cottage, don't we? Yeah, we do. I think I might want to come back to it, maybe revisit it uh, after not... discussing some of the others before putting it into a box. I think so. I think there's others that I think had a scaling kind of question that I thought might be very interesting to compare them. Lauren Cottage remains in the running for now. OK, so next we'll talk then about the Austro Passive House, our finalist for the central region. I love the diagonal cladding, so clever. That open plan space, it was just so brilliant, wasn't it? So filled with light. Very Macintosh-esque staircase, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. But really subtle, actually, isn't it? This contemporary new build is in the conservation village of Kippen. 
With sustainability a priority, it was designed and built by the owners Barry and Martin. We were really aiming to have this really low energy house that also was really beautiful and that was really important to us that it was an enjoyable space to be in but also kind of comfortable and I think marrying those two things is quite a challenge. I like to think that we have a nice mix of a sort of crisp architectural detailing but also with some comfortable and relaxing touches that make it feel really homely. I think we're both really proud. I mean, it's not something you say often, I think, being a Scottish person, but um, yeah, we, we worked really hard um, on our house and we, we put in a lot of love and a lot of time over six years, so I think we both feel really proud of what we've achieved. Getting to the final of Scotland's Home of the Year has just been such an amazing uh, moment in time for us and I think finishing the house last year and then this happening has just been, yeah, it's been a really uh, nice moment at the end of a really um, kind of long project. I know modern buildings aren't always necessarily to everyone's taste because they can obviously be a bit severe, you know, aesthetically, you know, and it is a box. I think it's a beautiful box, and I think that's actually very, very difficult to do well. They set certain constraints, but beautifully planned, beautifully detailed, a lot of drama, and all done with very few walls. So I think we've established that Michael's got a bit of a crush <laughs> on this one. <laughs> My heart's going like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I also did fall in love with it. I, it was so clever, and the scale of it was what impressed me, because I think when people build their own home. If there's a temptation to go large, and it really was just the size that it needed to be and no more. Although it was like a modernist cube, it did feel really soft. There was a mixture of furniture, there were patterns and colours and textures, there was that gorgeous curtain in the bedroom. All the lovely plants. It did really feel like a home, not like a kind of lifestyle choice. One thing I found is that with these buildings, because they're so grand, it can be hard to get that sort of charming, homely feel, which is something I always look for. But because they'd worked it in a way where they'd separate spaces, made those boxes within boxes, you always felt like you could have these little nooks in which to go to. It was surprisingly charming, actually. The other thing I really liked was it had that nod reference to the sort of the Macintosh-esque. Now, I've seen that done in a kind of sometimes quite a, I don't know, a kind of crude way, whereas I thought this was really subtle, really clever, a kind of nod to the country that it's from. And also, there's something about modernist architects imposing their way of life on the inhabitants, whereas I really felt like the design of this home had been generated from the way the people who designed it wanted to live. I think it's a really strong candidate. I definitely think it should be in our final three. I'm totally up for that one. <laughs> oh, shock. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I do agree. Austral Passive House is first to make it to the top three. So we're going to go from sublime minimalism to absolutely crazy colour. Let's talk about the Passel House, our gorgeous finalist for Shetland and Orkney. Usually I walk into a home and immediately yell, more colour, and I didn't have to do that in the home. <laughs> there was something kind of joyful and exuberant about just making their home their own using the power of colour. I also thought was really interesting was that from the outside you get nothing apart from the door. Jay and Rob have put a colourful stamp on this three-storey townhouse in Kirkwall. Our use of colour is probably what stands out the most about our home and that we've really just decorated it to please ourselves. It's not a home that everybody will love and that's fine. I think for me I'm most proud of just the amount of imagination and effort Jay has put into it. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm proud of what we've achieved on a budget because our budget has been really tight. But I think having a limited budget sort of forces creativity in a way. So we've had to find solutions around things that we couldn't afford to replace or redo. Um, so a lot of it is, is upcycled and, and repainted. We would love to win, yeah, yeah. but we don't think we're going but to. It's such a specific taste. <laughs> we are really absolutely thrilled. It's definitely not the biggest home. It's definitely not the most expensive home. But hopefully, um, it's recognised for its creativity, uh, which is really important to us, and um, that's the best thing. It was a technical dream, wasn't it? I just can't believe that that much colour can exist inside one building. And I love the way they sort of layered the colours. Remember in that main living room, there was pink on the walls and then a darker shade on the mantelpiece, and then they also had a pink sofa, so they didn't have any rules. It was just completely wild in there. 
I loved it. I can see why you might think it was a little bit too much, but personally for me, I thought it was so fantastic and just fun and lively. Lots of stuff had been upcycled, you know, old light switches had just been painted over, so they were pink too. You know, there was something kind of joyful and exuberant about just making their home their own. I always remember homes being painted in a very, you know, very, very much more minimal palette. And there was that idea that you picked out the special architectural elements, you know, the skirting and the door and everything in a different way. And it's been interesting to see this use of colour now that's obliterating that a little bit and sort of making the colour the predominant thing, not the element. It's an interesting thing I'm seeing happening and I think it's really, really fascinating. Oh, goodness. We're going to have real trouble um, whittling this down, aren't we? Because yeah. I, I still think that's a really, really good contender. It's definitely one that could go either way because it is so punchy. Because they went in. <laughs> there was not a, a room in that home that hadn't been splashed with paint. For me, I think it is such an amazing space and I, I really did connect with it. But then there's other homes that also carry that sort of very similar like, colourful vibe. Let's keep that one in play for now. The judges hold on to the pastel house but have to start making tough decisions. While they continue their deliberations, our finalists get to know each other and check out the competition. So we both really loved the, the pastel house. We thought it was, you know, had loads of charm and character and their use of colour was, was great. Their house totally matched who, who they were, yeah. which I thought was really, yeah, really lovely to, to see that as well. It's great to see how kind of creative everybody is. It's everybody, every home um, in the final is very, very different. There's no two to the same. It definitely meant for like cosy, colourful vibes. <laughs> it looks like it would be amazing in the winter with the log burner yeah, on. Yes, so we moved in last November. I think, I think the log burner was on for about three months. <laughs> so, yeah. The task the, the judges have got to decipher which one, or even the top three, would be so difficult from the, the other nine houses. Um, I think the top three will all be quite different from each other. Yeah. To pick one will be extremely difficult, but <laughs> they're, they're, that's what they get paid the big buck for. You've actually built it? Yeah, that's uh, impressive. Did, did it in, her, in our spare time. <laughs> um, so yeah, the cladding was a, a four-year endeavour. Oh, <laughs> that's chance. amazing. I love that it's on the angle as well. It's got a kind of static shape, um, being kind of a, almost a cube, so I yeah. thought that kind of gave it a bit of interest. Austro Passive House is one of my favourites. <laughs> I, I love the outer look to it and the, the way those boards are angled to the corner. <sighs> yeah, it's simple. Back in the deliberation room, the judges continue their discussions. OK, well, let's talk about another really colourful home, the Victorian Terrace, shall we? The, our beautiful finalists for the Lothians. I always get absolutely amazed that you can get a stone mullion that size on a bay window to hold up a building. I really enjoyed all that artwork on the walls and the choices of colours. They'd kind of worked with the building, then they had that wonderful dining, kitchen, very open, sociable space, which I love to see. The Victorian Terrace in Edinburgh is home to Ella, Rory, their children Daisy and Arthur, and Dougie the dog. We've injected a bit of fun and colour into the house, but it's not too fussy, we haven't taken it too seriously. There's no point because it's a busy house with kids and the dog and the cat, so you can't be too particular or worried about things getting messed up and stuff. I mean, if my name got called out, I, yeah, it would be hard to continue standing up, I think. <laughs> it would be so weird. I mean, even the thought just kind of gives me butterflies. So, I mean, I would be over the moon if we won. I think it would be just the most wonderful honor but I don't want to think like that at the moment because, you know, I just, it's, they're all such great houses. So happy for all, any one of those ones to win. We've discussed before, haven't we, how Victorian architecture can really, you know, you can really throw quite a lot at it and it still holds its own. It's got such a strong, sturdy personality. And certainly these homeowners really, really tested the ability of a Victorian home to take strong colour and exciting choices to the limit. I always knew I was going to be a little bit smitten with this one. And I think what they'd done with it was so impressive. It was very on trend. A lot of the decor decisions I'd seen a lot um, on social media, the dark walls and then the tiles mixing in the kitchen. I just thought it was a very, very vibrant family home. I love the way that it was very unprecious. It was clearly a family home designed to take the knocks without any fuss. Yeah, definitely. It had that uh, sort of functional vibe, but also beautiful. And I do think a building can be both. There was that sort of 
family element to it, but also, you know, perfectly styled. And the attention to detail was just incredible. So are we going to compare the Victorian Terrace and the Pastel House to such an extent that one of them isn't going to be in the final three? Not to throw a spanner in the works, but also I'm about to throw a spanner <laughs> in the works. <laughs> yeah. I think Lauren Cottage has that similar vibe where it's very on trends, lots of colour. They've not altered the structure too much. And they've created this very beautiful space that is functional and feels lived in and also very charming. So I think the three of them, I'm, I, I'm really struggling with because I love them equally, but I don't think they can all be in the top three. It's time for us to be brave. I think, and let's let's see if we can eliminate one of these three really colourful homes: Lawn Cottage, the Pastel House, or the Victorian Terrace. Which one of them goes? <laughs> I must admit, I think Lawn Cottage and the Pastel House stay with me as being more inventive. They stay with me as being. When I went through the door, I thought, "Wow!" Of the three, I suppose I would sacrifice the Victorian Terrace. But I would probably be happy eliminating the Victorian Terrace. It's really tough, isn't it? Mm. Because these are all on the table because we fell in love with them. But now we've, we've got to try and get from nine to one. So I'm going to turn the Victorian Terrace over. The Victorian Terrace is first to be knocked out. I'm going to suggest a change of flavour now. How about we talk about new Tolster, our finalist for the Hebrides? I could just sort of, I could picture it being a perpetual fairy story. In that home, you know, I could imagine you would just actually sort of never grow up in a funny sort of way. It was like a full size doll's house. Yeah, I've definitely never seen anything like it in my life, and I don't think I ever will again. With no stone left unturned in terms of opportunity for some kind of creative expression. Home to artist Tom, New Tolsta is near Stornoway in Lewis. My house is full of memories for me, and that says a lot about my age and how older people have accumulated all this history. I don't never feel lonely because I have all these things to remind me of the, the length of time I've been on this planet. To have somebody judging is a completely different kettle of fish. <laughs> it's quite tricky not being able to explain to a judge why that piece of furniture is there and what the history behind it is. Most people will think, what a wonderful Delft tile fireplace. <laughs> it's me who painted the tiles. It's not even tiles, it's just painted on. Because I can't afford the Delft tiles to go in, I couldn't find them, so paint them. So you can have it all. You know, if I can't afford a painting, well, I'm an artist, paint it yourself. What an absolutely magical, spectacular, miniature marvel that home was. I was quite moved even when he walked through the door, that sort of overpowering sense of who that person is. I really, really felt like you knew who lived there and kind of wanted to get to know them more. I couldn't have dreamt that up. It was really quite something, wasn't it? it was these memories of a, a kind of game going on in scale. Do you remember like opening the doll's house and finding another doll's house? And there was just that kind of Someone is playing incredibly clever games here. It's going to stay with me, that one. That's quite something. It was just almost sort of stuck in time with no signs of technology. And it almost was like things had just sort of settled there. You know, they'd always been in that home and life had just continued around them. When we walked in, we saw that gallery wall, which just seemed to continue forever up the staircase. That was the point where I was like, oh, this is, this is special. But my favorite room was actually that spare room up at the top that was that had the tongue groove and that beautiful sage color. I just think it was such a, an expression of character. To experience at up close the intense creativity of the homeowner. I don't think you could ever imagine some of the juxtapositions that we saw there, the pieces that he'd made alongside beautiful antique pieces, weird, quirky, vintage things. <laughs> the painted floorboards, mm -hmm. I mean... As a contender for me, I must admit, it's right up there. Yeah, I feel the same. It was just, it was magical. And I think it was, it just summed up who lived there so well. And I think that's kind of what I look for in a home. We all love New Tolster. So, so that's definitely staying. Yep. On the table. Yep. So, New Tolster remains in the competition. 
The homeowners continue their wait as the judges deliberate. We've uh, essentially used this like Swedish way of treating the floors, which is you soap uh -huh. the floors instead of like treating them with oil. Over and over and over again. Over and over. <laughs> and over. Did you do it? Brushing. Yeah. yeah. So, so we sanded it, and then you just have to brush them and brush oh, them and brush them. So the west of Scotland region is like it stretches so far. There's so many like amazing buildings and properties. So you don't really think that your own property would stand out with all of them, but that it did is so such an achievement. So the house had been derelict for 40 years or so. It was, it was more or less fully exposed to the elements. Yeah. There was very little right. that wasn't yeah. rotten inside. So. Yeah, so there's yeah. a new roof on it. So yeah, 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 it's a new roof. We were walking around looking at all the different homes and they're all so different. It's kind of got an imprint of wood. Mm -hmm. So when they, they built it, they must have used kind of a wooden pallet of some sort. Oh, yeah, to make the shuttering. It took a lot of pressure washing to get it <laughs> <laughs> nice and clean. Let me put my glasses on for this. I need to have a good look. Yes, I, I, this is fascinating with double window and then yeah, a, these are a all, double window these are joined all together. Original windows, so you, and none of them start, they don't stand straight. They're all skewed. Yeah. Quite yeah, I know what it's yeah. like jiggling yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> Long, all sizes. Yes, and yeah. 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 Meanwhile, the judges are struggling to whittle the homes down to just three. Let's have a change of scale and talk about Fire Station House, our finalist for the Borders and South. I think that there's that thing about a home and its setting. I think my favourite part of the home was the way you could stand at the mezzanine and look down, and from that view you could see the arch window with the little round window above it. Love repurposed buildings. Fire Station House in the Borders is John and Sheena's forever home. When we bought the building, it was just a church hall. The minute we walked in, we loved the building. We still love the building. Yeah. It's, it's a great home. Uh -huh. It's it's going to be our home forevermore, you know. Well, we could say that, that having a river running along the side of it makes it stand out. <laughs> it always, also comes with its dangers of the river rising um, past our yeah. window. From the outside, our house looks like two cottages, but once you're inside, it's quite modern. So, you know, it's kind of hiding what's inside, yeah, because folk are often yeah, quite people surprised. Yeah, get a lot of surprise they when they walk in, yeah. They do, yeah. yeah. That's the way we wanted to have it. You know, we wanted it to be bright and spacious. That's and, right, yeah. yeah, we, yeah that, the that colour in our houses or paintings or artworks, and yeah. what, that's what, what we wanted. We wanted yeah. the blank canvas. I mean, it would be nice to be in the top three, well, wasn't it? Of course it, it would, yeah. Super, yeah. Yes. yeah. And I quite fancied the bunch of flowers that was there if they looked good to you. <laughs> There's some kind of extra bit of interest that you get when you try and make a building that was never intended to be a home into a home. And yet when we walked into this building, you had this really strong sense of home, didn't we, Kate? I think for me it was that muted colour palette. Instantly I sort of felt quite soothed when I walked in. It was very relaxing. It was really well laid out, even though it had the sort of separate zones with the two staircases. I still felt like it was quite a, you know, it was all attached and it, it felt like it flows quite nicely despite that. What struck me about the building was I felt as if it was being rewarded for service rendered. <laughs> you know, it was like it had done all this work, putting out fires and saving lives and it was now being retired <laughs> and it was taking on the next chapter in its life and it could just go, done my work, I'm having a breather. <laughs> That's a lovely way of putting it. It did have a really serene atmosphere for a building that was designed for drama and the light was absolutely beautiful in there as well. I thought that some of the spaces felt a little generic in terms of their interior scheme. I felt as if when I came through the door I was initially actually a little bit Oh, OK, but it built in drama for sure. But I do wonder about that. And I did slightly wonder with the two stairs, I know why they were there, but it did seem like I just wish that somehow there could have been more of a connection. I felt as if there's a slight bit of a dead end when you went up the stairs. I'm talking spatially, you know, I'm yeah. coming at this from, you know, just from the architectural spatial quality. If a building has a potential journey through it, mm -hmm. I felt as if I might have been almost like, oh, I have to go down the stairs back and back up the other stairs. It would get fit for sure, but I did, <laughs> you know, I would wondered about that a little bit. Yeah, it's funny because actually the two different zones were what made me love it because I thought it just, it was just an interesting building but I could picture myself there spending a weekend, but I'm not too sure I could live there. It needed to be a little bit more punchy for me, I think. They've missed maybe a potential to 
be inspired in their interior choices, not only by their own interests and their own passions, but also by the history of the building, which isn't reflected in the way that they have designed the interior. So that's, there's, there's definitely something in there. Since we're talking about a repurposed building, hmm. shall we move on to our other repurposed building of, of our nine, which is the Old Waterworks, our finalist for the East. I think it's been a wonderful exercise in saying that there is no building that no longer has a purpose. It's the ultimate kind of personalization, isn't it, to take a concrete cylinder and turn it into a, a home. <laughs> I was so impressed that when we walked into that sort of barrel-like space that it was actually arched. The old waterworks near Crail is home to Sam, Ewan, children Sophie and Reuben, and dog Coco. Well, it was 11 years ago when we first put pen to paper to design the house, and then another good few years building. Yeah, we just built the house basically nights and weekends until we got through it. Yeah, it feels great being able to live in a house that we built. Every time we look at something, I know that how it's made and how it's been built and put together. Looking back, we've really enjoyed it. There's been a lot of tears, there's been a lot of tantrums, disagreements, but there's also the memories we've made through it is great. Seeing the children so young and helping paint and helping do it all, not only are we really proud, but they'll grow up being very proud of their home as well. I really didn't think we would get to this stage simply because we don't have a, a, a massive house that's had a lot of money spent on it. It's all DIY and we've just done it ourselves. We're, we're no experts, but we are still really proud of what we've achieved. Now, if you think about that building, it was essentially just a closed in thing to store water and did not require any of the things that you'd think a home would need, specifically light. Mm -hmm. And that was introduced in a really controlled, sensitive way, celebrating that rawness of the concrete and then building this other extension in the back to make it more livable and allow you to break out of that intensity. I think a lot of credit to that, just taking that on as an exercise. Yes, definitely ambitious mm -hmm. and um, extremely unusual. I don't think we've ever seen a home quite like it. You're going to have to make compromises when you're extending a building that's as peculiar as, as this one and there's probably as many ways of adding to that as there are architects, designers and homeowners. So you know, as, a, as a home, the homeowners have made it to suit themselves and the way they want to live and they've managed to bring light into it and that outside area, that sunken outside area, mm. you could use that all year round, tucked out of the wind, tucked out of view. It's, a, it's an extra room in the home and a really brilliant contrast to the kind of dark cavernous space that the old water cylinder gave them. And it's, you know, the only home I think we've got that's got grass on the roof. We've only managed to eliminate one so, so far. So if we're comparing between our two repurposed homes, is there one of those that we can eliminate at this point? I think for me it would probably be the fire station house to be eliminated. I just don't think it stands up to the very impressive builds of the old waterworks. Kate, I'm with you, 100%. I, you know, I do, I do think there was an ambition, there was a difficulty about taking on something like the, the old waterworks. OK, I, I, I agree. So, we'll say cheerio to fire station house. Sadly, yes. OK. Fire Station House is only the second home to be eliminated. OK, we've still got two more that we haven't uh, discussed at all. Our finalist for Glasgow and the Clyde Valley, Pentland View. Just a simple house with a fantastic extension. I just think the extension had been done perfectly. It's very difficult, I think, to get a space like that correct. Pentland View in South Lanarkshire is home to Navraj, Rachel and dog Algy. One of the things that's special about our house for me is that we've brought something which was utterly derelict and not just brought it back into life, but made it, you know, more or less a zero carbon house, you know, highly sustainable, really lovely, warm place to live. I mean, that's what I enjoy about living there is that I've never lived in a warm, like a warm house before <laughs> that isn't drafty and that we have, you know, the old house, which is kind of dark and cosy and then the new extension, which is 
light and bright and modern. We tried to approach it having a kind of minimal palette of materials and colours. The way the spaces flow works, works for me. I like the lights. I mean, I think there's, you know, the light is very, very different in different parts of the house, but I think it's always lovely. Even on the coldest day, if the sun shines for 30 seconds, it's suddenly, you know, almost overwhelmingly warm. It's just lovely. And in Scotland, there's no such thing as overwhelmingly warm. You've got this beautiful cottage, not extravagant, very simple building, very simply extended, but wow, what an extension. Just that space was so, so beautiful. Every single object in there felt like it was curated, but curated in a way that wasn't fussy, that wasn't pretentious. Everything was there for a reason, to be functional, but also to provide joy. There was something about the sustainability of it, the idea that it's super, super stylish, treading very lightly on the earth. I found that it felt like it was all in harmony, even though we had this old building with the, the newer extension, everything felt very sympathetic to the, to the other half of the home. The kitchen was quite contemporary with the grey tiles and, and the light wood cabinets. And then on the other side, they had a, a very modern pink sofa and then that vintage chest against the wall and just so many plants. It was just a wonderful room. I don't think they could have done it any better. That upstairs library, the corridor made into a library with that window at the end. I know you like a window at the <laughs> end of a view. You've got to have a window. And it delivered, didn't yes, it? Yes, it did. It was a nice moment, that, I must admit. I felt, actually, as I walked through this, that I was being increasingly having revelations. It's the yin and yang of the conversion, that there was the, you know, pulling the new into the window frames of the old building and allowing bits of the old to go into the extension, I thought it was subtle, but really, really nicely done. It really grew on me, this one. It mm. wasn't one at the time I remember thinking, wow, but as I was in it more, it began to sort of seep into me and just how subtle and clever it was. Yeah, yeah, really, really strong sense of home in that one. Goodness me. So. We're all agreed that that's a really, really strong contender. We're not, we're not going to be turning that one over anytime soon. It has to be in the final three. Pentland View is the second home to make it through to the top three. So the last one that we haven't spoken about is another one that we all loved, which was Rue Boathouse, the delightful finalist for the West. I loved so much about this home. It was just perfectly styled. It was a really intricately styled home, wasn't it? The bit I really loved was getting to that writing area on the top. Rue Boat House has been home to Patricia, Patrick and all the other dogs since 2019. It's an unusual building anyway, I think in the fact that it's a terrace, it looks fairly humble and modest from the outside, but then when, I think when you walk in... You don't expect the interior, I don't think that you expect the colour scheme. We have the Swedishness and the Frenchness and the Englishness and the antiques and everything, and I think that that's what makes it stand out. Yeah, absolutely. And that we've also tried to be. use a lot of reclaimed items. We are DIY, like novices. We have never done this before. And we, when we moved into the house, we were saying that, oh, we'll just get Patrick's dad to do everything. I think if he'd have done the work, we certainly wouldn't, be, wouldn't no. have been sat here now. No. It, would have been, it would have been maybe five years down the line. <laughs> We just wanted to have a go at doing it ourselves. Yeah, so actually to be able to have learned also the process of like laying floors, sanding floors, you know, thinking about colour schemes and like how to build a kitchen and where things should go is a lot. But that we were able to do that is quite, yeah. Yeah, quite, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm very happy about that we have learned to do that. It was almost like a lifestyle. You could imagine yourself living there and sort of, I feel like I'd be a happier person if I lived in that home. It was just so tastefully done. It's those kind of interiors that make it so homely and charming. I shouldn't have liked it. That's I, true. I shouldn't have. I felt like it, to me, it was like that sort of teenager being fed warm broth by their granny. <laughs> bear with okay, me, right. bear with me, bear with me. <laughs> You know, almost that recalcitrant teenager, nothing's going to make them happy. And then that lovely bowl of warm broth made by the granny just solves all the world's problems just like that. And it made me feel safe, warm, secure, no matter what all the turmoil was going on in the rest of the world. 
Rue Boathouse offered this kind of possibility of a way of living one's best life and being one's best self. When I saw it, I thought, this is one of my dream homes, I think. It's a really special place. We need to get down to at least three, and we're not doing very well. <laughs> so we've got to pull our socks up. <laughs> and we are judges after I know. All. Why don't we compare Rue Boathouse with Lawn Cottage, since they're both compact, both <laughs> stylish. For me, Rue Boathouse edges it over Lawn Cottage. There are more layers of subtlety in Rue Boathouse, maybe slightly more personal. I agree. I, I, I do like Lawn Cottage for its, um, re, you know, the reuse of that sort of really intimate kind of scale. I was in a similar scale of spaces in Rue Boathouse, but I felt that I was being given a little bit more, I don't know, just sophistication in terms of how it had been decorated throughout. Mm -hmm. I think if it's between them and I'm going to have to choose one, I think to be eliminated would have to be Lauren Cottage. I know, it feels like, it's, it's like being mean to a kitten, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's too cute. We love you, Lauren Cottage. Lauren Cottage is out, but with Ford Homes still in contention, only one can join Pentland View and Austro Passive House in the final three. As it plays out, you know, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm, I suppose what I'm looking for is that really unique, really dynamic, really challenging uh, totality, both inside and out. And I suppose the Passel House is one, although I enjoyed all the scenography of it, I feel that there are others that are sticking in my mind more that made me go, oh, what? <laughs> and so I did enjoy the colours, thought they were really wonderful, but it doesn't stay with me as dynamically as the others do. It was a spectacular homage to a very particular kind of aesthetic and I suppose the kind of interior that you would not expect and that juxtaposition of a dream world inside a terraced house was quite irresistible. But I think it's not as strong as some of the others that we've been talking about. So I'm happy to, to eliminate it now if you're both in agreement. I think we have to take those steps in order to move us on, absolutely. Yeah. OK, then. All right, I'm doing it. OK. The Pastel House is eliminated, leaving the old waterworks, Rue Boathouse and New Tolsta vying for the final place in the top three. Oh, and then there were five. Ooh. OK. We should discuss the old waterworks. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was so exciting. It's the kind of project that I have dreamed of doing. And maybe that's part of the problem because I'm looking at it and thinking, oh, there's little missed opportunities. There's ways that it potentially could have been done better. I would have wanted my living space to be inside the, the tunnel. And I think it was a shame that they chopped the tunnel up to make other rooms. I would have wanted to see that volume as one all the way through and make the extension much more subservient to it. I had a kind of strange architectural moment. Any protrusion in a building will obviously have significance. And the, the thing that struck me immediately was there was this big protrusion right in the middle, and I immediately assumed that was the front door. <laughs> and it, it wasn't. It's a shame, isn't it? Because it it's, is. so, it's so extraordinary and so different. But I think there are other homes still in contention that are inhabited slightly better. I mean, I think the old waterworks will always be there as the project that said, Nothing is impossible to be converted yes. into a home. So congratulations for an extraordinary repurposing of a weird object. But we're eliminating you. <laughs> the judges say goodbye to the old waterworks, leaving just four homes in the competition. We are close to getting to our final three. We haven't spoken about you, Tolster, for a while. I thought it was absolutely amazing. I thought, you know, if we're talking about ways of living your best life and being the best version of yourself, if that's a criteria that represents what home is, about a home being somewhere where you can be yourself in the best way possible, it's quite interesting to talk about that in the context of Rue Boathouse, isn't it? Is New Tolster a more sincere expression of that concept than the Rue Boathouse? It's certainly a more exuberant one. <laughs> I can absolutely see myself living in Rue Boathouse, but again, there's just that, it was just slightly 
perhaps too perfect for me, but that's also what makes me love it. So I'm, I'm finding that one really, really tough. Whereas New Toaster, there's just nothing else like it. And it just stands out to me as a home that is special and, and really deserving. That gives us no choice then, but to say goodbye to Rue Boathouse. The last home to be eliminated is Rue Boathouse, meaning New Tolster takes the final place in the top three. So we have our final three and what an interesting range we have. We've got beautiful modernist new build with the Ostro passive house. We have a sensitively extended traditional stone cottage with Pentland view and we have a tiny croft house that has been encrusted with history and with love. Three really unique finalists. It was a lovely surprise to get the, the phone call that we were through to the final and I don't think I'd quite anticipated what a huge area of Scotland we were representing. I think being in the top three is a, a win. Being on the show is a win. Being in the final is a win. I mean, you know, it's, it's all wonderful. I kind of hope it would give people an idea of, mm. you know, that you can recuperate an old building without just sticking in plastic double glazed windows. Um, and do it in a kind of sensitive way. Scotland, I feel, has got an, you know, a real abundance of old houses which are in some state of dilapidude. And you know, this is a built environment which is so fragile, but yet it can be restored and you know, brought up to standard. Not easily, but it can be done. And I think our home is a good example of that. This can be done you know, at a modest price. To end up in the top three would be, would be very nice but extremely nerve-wracking. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice to think of actually winning more, not for myself, but for that style of house, to know that an old wreck of a house can actually still be considered a real home. In the village, the talk would be like berserk. It'd go absolutely berserk to think that one of those silly little old crofters' cottages had won this thing. And my immediate neighbor had said to another neighbor, before I was finished, I'd still repairing bits and pieces. He said, I don't know what he's messing around with that old hovel for. <laughs> it would shake them up um, and it would make them look at their own homes a lot more and think, actually, these old cottages can be all right. I have butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I'm quite nervous about how this is going to unfold. If I was to win Scotland's Home of the Year, honestly, my jaw would just hit the floor. <laughs> I just don't, I just can't imagine. I would, I would just be really, really proud and really happy. I don't envy the judges at all having to make that kind of decision between them all. They've just got, yeah, such a, a range of things to consider, I suppose, from, um, you know, kind of architectural projects to refurbishments. If I had to phone Martin and tell him that we'd won, I think he would just be, he would just be so excited. <laughs> He'd be so happy. I don't even know if he'd be able to speak. He'd probably be lost for words, which would be quite a rare thing. <laughs> Now we've got to try and choose one winner from this fabulous, incredibly varied trio. So, the Ostro Passive House. It is such a sustainable building. You know, when we're living in the climate emergency, here's a building that is not sacrificing any style whatsoever, and yet is meeting Passive House standards, and not only that, it's meeting the gold standard in building regs, i.e. it's going above and beyond and I think full compliments to do that. The level of detail and the amount of tiny, tiny decisions that have built up in, in layers to create that. It looks really simple, but it's incredibly complicated. It was just such an impressive structure, but actually inside, it was quite homely, especially the way they sort of made that open plan living area with the two different seating options. And it was just all around a very, very wonderful home. Come back to that building in 100 years. Mm -hmm. It will be a very, very different character. And in that intervening period, it has not harmed the planet one iota. We have ended up with three quite different ways of living very, very sustainably. So if we move on to Pentland View, you've got an existing building given new life, new windows, an extension that's well insulated. So it's not a passive house, but it is environmentally responsible. They're cultivating the land around them and, and growing their own fruit and vegetables, which is, it's, it's not the same as having the gold standard, 
but it is another way of enhancing your way of living responsibly on this planet. The way that they'd sort of mix it old and new, a lot of it was second-hand or upcycled or definitely done on a budget. So again, it does, it does feel like a very responsible home. And it was also very beautiful. I mean, they're all beautiful. <laughs> and they have saved a building that one could argue might have gone. How many times have we seen the shells of buildings like this with no roof and trees growing out of them and then somebody's built a new bungalow just mm -hmm. alongside? So, yes, there, there's, there's lots of buildings like this, but not many that have been given the amount of love that this one has. When we're speaking about, you know, this idea of sustainability, you know, and sustaining a lifestyle, when we come to New Tolsta, there's a lifestyle that is being sustained, again, a very unique one, but someone living a life where they are translating their artistic creativity, making it and literally transferring it back into their own home, almost sustaining themselves by their creativity in the home they live in. And that is really quite a remarkable example of that type of living. I can't think of anything bad to say about it. It was just, it's probably a home that you have to even see to believe because it was just so curated, but in a very humble way. I love the idea that everything in that home had you know, been repurposed or given a new life or just sort of been found or salvaged. It's just a lovely way of living. It's that kind of circular economy thing. Or, or nothing is thrown away, nothing is wasted. Yes, in, in a completely different way, it's having no impact. But we're not only talking about environmental standards. I'm just mentioning that in the context of the Passive House because it's so interesting that the three finalists are all in their different ways so environmentally responsible. But we're talking about home and what makes home. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we're talking about something feeling like home, but it's not our home, it's not your home, it's not... Yeah, that's home. right. It's not for, it's, you know, the home that we would live in. Mm. But if we're looking for the home that says this is the most unique, spectacular example of one person or, or a homeowner, homeowners, translating their lifestyle and the way they want to live into a unique and, and fascinating way. <laughs> there is one that jumps out. Really no words for how wonderful it was. I, su I suppose I have a feeling that I, I've seen the other two. They're brilliant examples, but my world has been slightly changed. I've been shown a completely different way of life. And I, I, it's, it's, I genuinely, sort of shifted my perception of what I think home could be. That's, that's really, really interesting, Michael, um, because before we started this conversation, I, I didn't have a clear idea out of any of these three which one I thought was like, going to be our winner. But the more we talk about it and the way that we're talking about what our criteria are, that it is the homeowner's criteria, that the that the homeowner that has pushed the envelope of what it means to express yourself in the place you live in. Yeah, I agree. I... <laughs> I'm actually, I'm genuinely, I'm... I'm having a moment. I'm, I am absolutely having a moment, you <laughs> yeah. know, because, because there was also, in that landscape, that bedding in, that sense of being part of the earth, part of the planet, but contributing in a fresh way, everything that's created, any, any creativity is a new thing, so there's been new life continually being created into this home that felt Fresh and new. Michael, you're making me. I just honestly. <laughs> you're was... making me cry. Uh, honestly, I just. Right, I've got to pull myself together. <laughs> so, we're agreed then, unanimously. Our decision is made. Now, somebody get me a hanky. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, I'll get makeup all over it. No, it's fine. That's what it's there for. <laughs> And now the time has come for the judges to reveal the winner of Scotland's Home of the Year. <laughs> oh, thank you all for letting us explore your gorgeous, gorgeous homes and for putting yourselves up for consideration for Scotland's Home of the Year. Yeah, it's been a bittersweet day for us today. It's been lovely to discuss your homes in detail, but not quite so fun to have to whittle it down to just one winner. We've had to compare and contrast nine stunning homes, all of them so different, everything from a tiny little cottage to a grand three-storey townhouse. Each and every one of them could have been a worthy winner. So we've managed to, after much deliberation, get a short list of three and in no particular order, 
The first home on the shortlist is an absolutely character-packed, wildly beautiful, creative home. New Tolster. And the second home to make it into our top three is the exquisitely detailed, refined, sublime, gorgeous, modern home with outstanding sustainable credentials, Austro Passive House. <laughs> And the final home in our top three is a home we chose for its country charm and attention to detail. It's Pentland View. <laughs> <Whew. laughs> but there can only be one winner. And it gives us great pleasure to announce that Scotland's Home of the Year is... New Tolster. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> uh, well <laughs> should I say something now? <laughs> Just a little something. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'd like to thank Donald and Norman <clears throat> for listening to me, their neighbours, and encouraging me to go on, but all just, just to listen to my doubts of whether I should even be in this contest. So, um, yeah, it's just been a very strange experience, but wonderful, and I've just thoroughly enjoyed being with all the other contestants and yeah we all deserve to win anyway didn't we <laughs> that's the truth yeah, yeah. thank you Delighted, yeah, totally blown away. I can't, I mean, I can't quite believe it. <laughs> That's a great feeling. It's been amazing. It's been such an amazing day meeting all these new people and seeing all of their homes. And yeah, the whole experience has been wonderful. Uh, slightly stumped, <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I mean, I think any. There were, there were so many good houses. I think anybody could have been in the top three, but that was just fantastic. <sighs> I really didn't expect this. <laughs> I'll have to watch it with a neighbour. And it'll be, I won't tell him, <laughs> it'll be really nice to see his reaction. <laughs> I mean, one neighbour describing it as a hovel. I mean, you know, they will start looking at the house differently and they might start looking at me a bit differently <laughs> as well. 